um, gypsum board is used in drywall, and it's very absorbent, so you can see why we would not want these ones to get stained and start to deteriorate. As you come down, you can see with this light, there is one that's broken open here. It's gypsum on the outside. The second layer is what's called red wall limestone, and then in the center, you're gonna see selenite crystal. So as you guys come by, feel free to stop and take a look. I'm gonna stop right at the end of the fence, and I'll tell you how our hole in the ground is found. <coughs> <laughs> uh, now those gypsum formations they tell us um, just kind of off subject real quick the gypsum formations were formed um, 15 million years ago when we were still underwater and that's why they're you know again so uh, we're so worried about protecting them however let's go on and decide how uh, discover how this was found 1927 it's the middle of summer, which is monsoon season in Arizona, and we get pretty heavy rains, and they do last quite some time. There's a gentleman named Walter Peck, and he's a local woodcutter from the area. He's on his way to a poker game to meet his brother and some friends, and unfortunately for Walter, he got caught in one of those monsoon storms. So rather than you know, ride it out, Walter decided to pull over under a cedar tree, tie off his horse, give the horse a break, and keep himself dry. Well, he unfortunately had to sit there and wait for two to three hours before the storm finally passed by. As he sat there, he was paying attention to a hole in the ground that water flowed into the entire time. However, it never filled. Piqued his interest, however, not enough to stop the poker game, so off Walter went to play poker. Um, at the poker game, he sat down and was telling his brother Miles about what he had found in the hole and how it wouldn't fill up with water. So the next day, Miles and Walter came back to the spot. Um, at which time, you know, they did a little excavating and re realized they had a hole in the ground. So... Miles, being the older brother, told Walter, hey, guess what? You found the hole. You're going down first. They tied a 150-foot rope around Walter's waist, gave him a kerosene lantern in one hand, a handful of matches in the other, and over the side, Walter went into a black hole. Um, Walter got down here, lit his kerosene lantern, and was ecstatic because Walter assumed that he had found gold ore all through the ceilings. Walter thought that he had found silver ore in many of the walls, but most importantly for Walter, Walter thought he had found diamonds just about everywhere. So as we proceed around this corner, we're going to hit our first man-made tunnel and a set of stairs. Please watch your head on the ceiling as you enter the tunnel. Watch the third step up. It is a little taller than the rest. I'll meet you up in the top and I'll tell you what Walter did find. Duck, little duck. Oh, hit my head. arch-like formations that were naturally formed due to the slightly acidic water that flowed through these caverns, but also it got its name because we've had over a dozen weddings down here as well. Now, the water that used to run through these caverns, as I said, was slightly acidic, um, meaning that every time it, it, it encountered a softer mineral, a softer limestone, it was able to actually eat away and make its way into new cracks and crevices. As you come this way, you're going to notice in the ceiling two of what we call our ancient waterways. This was some of the ways the water was trying to make its way out of the cavern toward the surface. These two specific ancient waterways go up 90 feet from where we're standing and then just completely stop. There is a third one. It's blocked by this rock formation here. However, on the way out on the tour from the other side, I will be sure to point that one out for you as well. As you guys go ahead and proceed up, 
So you will notice we don't have many stalactites or stalagmites, like I said, but we do have one or two. You can see one here. And again, that's probably the biggest stalactite we're ever going to be able to show you. This, we call it flowstone. It's actually just petrified mud. And as we're coming up the trail, as I was saying, so Walter thought he had found yeah. riches beyond belief. And what Walter decided to do was start mining immediately. So Walter came down and brought himself a pick and a shovel. And right about here in this hole is where Walter started his prospecting. Walter dug this hole himself with just a pick and a shovel. And Walter proceeded to gather just as many samples as he possibly could before he was off and running to the assayer's office. And that's when Walter's day went from good to bad. The very first thing Walter found out was all of Walter's gold ore was nothing more than iron oxide, known to me or you today as rust. Walter found out that all of his silver ore is nothing more than a low-grade form of tin known as considerite. And the unfortunate thing about that was it would actually cost more money to turn into tin than it would be worth as tin. So that's strike two. Strike three is every single time Walter would try to chip one of the diamonds out of the wall, it would just crumble to du shiny dust in his hand. Letting him know that he hadn't found diamonds at all, he just found some crystal. So at this point, Walter is pretty much distraught. He can only think of one thing to do. Let's start a tour company. Walter decides to open tours for 25 cents a piece he will tie a rope around your waist. He will lower you 150 foot down the hole with a kerosene lantern and a handful of matches and allow you to, at your leisure, explore the caves. Keep in mind, there were no pathways and no railings. So basically what you were walking on is what you see over here to my right hand side. You are walking around in this black cave with a kerosene lantern. Pretty much doing what you want. Now here's the problem. Yeah, I was wondering what that was too. Walter was slightly a forgetful man. And he had a lot to do on the 800 acres, 800 acres that he owned. So there were days when if you were down here a little bit too long exploring, Walter would pull the rope up and go home. And Walter would not come <laughs> back to get you until the next morning. And if you came in from the front entrance, you noticed that there was a mannequin out there and it said go on the rope. It actually became so common. Oh, now that makes that sense. Go on the rope out there. Would bring chairs and actually sit around and watch the tourists be lowered through the hole and place bets on how many of them were going to make it out before yeah. Walter went home for the day and how many were going to be forgotten down in the hole. <laughs> we took Walter's accidental idea and put some purpose behind it. We created what is called a tavern suite. This is two wing beds, a sofa that folds out into a third bed, hot and cold running shower, a flush of in the cavern, as well as a flat screen <laughs> television. Now, um, what's interesting about this is we don't have cable, we don't have internet, there's no direct TV down here. However, we did bring a DVD player, and it's interesting to me that the two most popular movies we get requested for down here are The Cave and The Descent. Anybody that has seen them know that they are movies about people being eaten alive in a cave in the dark. <laughs> so as you guys proceed on up the trail, right where I'm standing, to my left and my right, are two of what we like to refer to as floor drains, or ancient waterways. And as I said, when our plateau was lifted above the water table, this is how the water left. These two floor drains here currently go down 1,700 feet to the water table below where it sits today. You can go off the trail with a guide and the proper equipment, and you can explore these little side caverns and caves in what's called our exploratory. Um, however, I will say that they are a bit tight, so if you're claustrophobic, it might not be something you're interested in doing. Those two that you're looking at right now only go down about 35 feet before they become too small for humans to go any further. That's crude. And as you guys can see over here, you're going to notice this little glass is late. This holds two forms of selenite crystal, um, very rare forms actually, and the first one being right here mm. in the center. It's this little teacup handle. If you haven't had dinner, it might look like a happy memory. Uh, that is called a helitite. It translates from the Latin very loosely to horn or hollow. Um, if you look it up on Google, Google, excuse me, it says that it is, it is a distorted stalagmite. It was formed underwater. This particular one took four hours for our cavers to bring up 30 feet. They are so delicate that if you touched it, 
you, just like Walter Peck found out, would have a handful of shiny dust. The other crystal you see here at the top is the absolute rarest form of selenite crystal that you can find. I'm only going to be able to point it out naturally in the cave to you in two or three spots. We brought a few pieces here for you to be able to see it, but again, it's the rarest form of selenite crystal that we have. It gets its name because it just looks like frosted rocks during winter out here. Um, as a matter of fact, my whole front yard, when it first starts to snow, when the first snow comes in the winter, that's what all the rocks in my yard look like. The only difference is, if you snap that in half, it's crystal all the way through. And again, Walter was chipping this away, thinking he was finding diamonds, and it was just turning to glittery dust in his hands. As you guys come up, please feel free to stop and take a peek, take a picture, whatever you'd like to do. I'm going to proceed up the trail, and I'll meet you right up here at this next platform. Now the other interesting thing about this platform itself is, as I was telling you previously, we've had about a dozen weddings down here. This platform here that you're standing on now is actually the site of the very first wedding ever performed in the cave. 1977, the chef in our kitchen and the girl that used to run our curio shops met and fell in love and decided they were going to get married right here in the caverns. When her parents heard the news, their only question was why. Her response was kind of a bad pun at the time, but she told him that she wanted her marriage to start off on a rock-solid foundation. <laughs> that turned out to be actually very fortuitous because they are still to this day married, happily living in Phoenix, and they keep in contact actually yearly through postcards and Christmas cards. However, they did want us to remember them after they left. So she went ahead and left the veil from her wedding gown. <laughs> Over the years, all the other brides that got married down here wanted a little... Uh, spot on the wall themselves. One of the ones we like to point out is this one here. And this is interesting because this bouquet, you can still see a little bit of red in the flowers. You can still see some green in the leaves. That bouquet was placed there in the year 2000. That is a 19-year-old wedding bouquet. Because of the low humidity, because of the very subtle temperature changes, excuse me, and because of the absolute no moisture, things are preserved perfectly. We also are what's called, we call it a dead cave, is there is no animal life of any kind in these caverns. There's not spiders, there's not ants, there's not flies, moths, bugs, no bats, no rats, no snakes, no lizards. Nothing survives in these caverns. We have yet to find anything. You could be down here in the middle of summer and you won't even see a moth or a fly flying around. Um, so again, you can see how well things are preserved, but you can also see how anything that fell in here with nothing to drink would quickly dehydrate and quickly probably be mummified, to be honest with you, as you'll see later on up the trail. Now, as we proceed, this is going to be the second of our man-made tunnels, and I'd like to give everybody a heads up. It's going to start out at a 6% grade. It is going to increase to a 26% grade by the time you get to the top. It's 160 feet long, took two years and 40 cases of dynamite to excavate out. So as you guys come up, just watch your heads as you enter, and I'll meet you up at the top. This is about the only spot you're going to have to watch out for. No, 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 no.
can of corn. Eat can of corn. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is the largest room in our cabins. It's made for halls of gold because when Walter found this place, he thought this was the largest deposit of the gold ore. We all know how that turned out. Um, however, this room itself is 630 feet in length. That's a little over two football fields. And what's interesting about this room is in 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, we were declared a fallout shelter for the surrounding 65 miles. So the Civil Defense Department brought down boxes of food in the form of crackers and a carbohydrate supplement in the form of a hard candy. They brought down hundreds of barrels of water, each containing 17 and a half gallons. They also brought down medical supplies as well as sanitation supplies. That was to hold 2,000 people from the surrounding 65 miles for two and a half weeks. In 2011, we were again reminded we are still a fallout shelter, at which time we brought down well over a thousand cases of water bottles, and we brought down food in the form of MREs, or better known as meals ready to eat. A lot of my soldiers that come down here tell me they're actually called meals refused by everyone. <laughs> um, and we didn't increase the number of people that we could contain for, um, in the caverns, but we increased the length of time that they could stay. So two and a half weeks has now gone to three months. We can support 2,000 people in these caverns with the supplies you see here. Now, one of the interesting things I'd like to point out is everybody always asks about the toilet situation. Well, you notice here you have that round toilet seat. Mm -hmm. That was designed specifically to go on those bought barrels. And the reason for that was after you use the restroom, you could seal the barrel again keeping the ammonia and the bacteria from contaminating the air in the cabins. Um, very well thought out plan, and they were designed for just that. Once the barrel was empty of water, they would then use that for their toilet. As you pass this case, you're gonna see all of the supplies, uh, medical and sanitary, as well as the crackers and the carbohydrate uh, supplements that were brought down in 1962. Two interesting facts. The crackers still taste like crackers, a little bit scale, but they are still um, nutritionally of value. And even more interesting, they're not like a saltine cracker. They're more like an unleavened bread. And it was designed that way specifically so that as you ate the cracker and drank the water, you would actually become full. The hard candy carbohydrate supplements, however, are now chewy carbohydrate supplements. But they kept their lemon and cherry flavor perfectly. They just lost the hard candy um, form that they were in. Now they're more like a soft caramel. Um, and you guys, please feel free to look at these and we're going to go ahead and head on down here. And again, I ask you guys as you can see down the trail, watch your head and watch your right side. Well, how they got all down here? That's... <laughs> mm -hmm. me. That's a lot of moving my hand, I think. <laughs> What happened? We're not going up that way? <laughs> uh oh, I think we're going around.
Concussion Dome. Duck. That they looked like toasted marshmallows that he made the night before camping. So his name was Zachary, and I told him everybody that I would give him credit for any time I used his toasted marshmallow spiel. <laughs> now, one of the things you guys are going to find interesting about this is, first of all, this is a 15 million year old gypsum uh, formation. Excuse me. Now, back when Walter was doing his tours, you were down here alone, allowed to do what you wanted to do. That is 40 years of people touching the gypsum formation. Not only is it stained permanently, but all of the balls have since just degraded. Pretty soon, if it was to continue, you would just have a flat, dirty wall. Um, the entire uh, area here used to look like this, and that's what it should look like. One of the other things that happened with all those tours is, again, not maliciously and by any means, you know, it was just what he had to work with at the time, kerosene lanterns. They let off a little black smoke if you've ever used one. They also create a little condensation when the chimney is down over the flame. And you see what happens to a gypsum wall as it absorbs kerosene smoke. So again, very much stained. Now, the one thing that I do like to point out is back here behind us, if you see where my light is shining, you're seeing those pink snowballs. That is just how absorbent gypsum is. Behind that formation is a wall of red wall limestone. And it is leaching the color from the red wall limestone into the gypsum formation out front. Now, the great thing is it doesn't harm the formation. It's not acid or oil or um, you know, sweat from your hands. It's just a natural mineral. So even though they're discolored, they're going to stay perfectly formed like they are now. And ladies and gentlemen, as we proceed on up this trail here, again, please just watch your step, use the handrails. And we're going to head right up here to this next side of the area in the Richmond District Room. So ladies and gentlemen, this is what is known as our mystery room. I'd like to point out, first of all, that rock surface there is exactly 318 feet below the surface um, where you enter from upstairs. The reason we call this the mystery room is we know for a fact that our air comes and goes through here. We just don't know where. Is it 10 miles away? Is it 40 miles away? Is it 100 miles away? We are not sure. Um, one of the things that was told for years as a myth was in 1954, a group of cavers came down set off red smoke bombs, and red smoke was seen coming out of the walls of the Grand Canyon. That is utterly and completely a falsehood for mainly two reasons. With a limestone cavern like you see here, had they set off red smoke bombs right there at the bottom, all of this limestone would now be red. It would absorb the color right out of the smoke. The other reason is the canyons from here are 65 miles as the crow flies. That smoke would have tried to fill every crack and crevice along the way and been well dissipated before even the halfway point. So, the smoke bomb theory was debunked. However, that does not mean that our air does not come from the Grand Canyon. We're just not sure yet. We have the National Theological Society that has told us, actually just last week I spoke with one of their gentlemen, Paul, who was in here. The way this works is, on a high barometric pressure day, the air comes down our elevator shaft and goes out this tunnel. Those are days when the cavers want to be here because they can light their incense and follow the smoke deeper into the caverns and keep ex excavating more and more rooms, more and more caverns and shafts. Mm -hmm. On a low barometric pressure day, the air actually comes back through this cavern and up our elevator shaft. They want nothing to do with those days because obviously the smoke would just be blowing right back in their faces. Um, now this is actually called part of our wild tour. And again, with a guide and the proper gear, you can go down here and you can explore the 440 feet of new caverns, caves, and rooms that they have discovered up to this point and made safe. Um, if you're claustrophobic, you might want to rethink it because the first 15 feet of the journey is actually an army crawl, hands and knees. But okay. then it does open up in the bigger caverns and caves, uh, at which time you're spending two to three hours and they're yours to explore. Now, 
Another interesting fact about this is we have been down here several times, um, again, on the Explorer Tours, and every time they go, they find upward shafts. Some go as high as 80 feet. They, check, they name them disappointment domes because they're not looking for upward shafts. What they believe they're looking for are downward shafts, and the reason for that is they believe there's another cavern system just like this one directly under our feet. And that could be why no one has been able to find the air exit slash entrance here. It could actually be down a shaft in another cavern with an entirely different exit in an entirely different direction. So again, aptly named the mystery room. We are still studying this. They've been here for 20 years trying to answer these questions for us. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Bobcat Trail. Just take your time, use the handrail. So ladies and gentlemen, this is Bob. Bob is a 169-year-old mummified bobcat. He fell through the National Ocean in the year 1850 and unfortunately broke his back leg. As he smelled the air coming from the mystery room, he tried to crawl from the natural entrance, which is ahead of us, down through all of this rubble to the mystery room where he thought he would find a way out. Unfortunately, with his back legs being broken, him being dehydrated, there's no water down here, and he's dragging himself through limestone dust, breathing this in. He unfortunately mummified himself from the inside out. We did find his back leg, and we did have it carbon dated. It did come back 1850, so again, he is 169 years old. And if you're not familiar with what Bob Cat should look like, this is Robert. <laughs> Robert comes from the land of eBay, and the owners brought him in again for just the, the younger kids, the tour groups that we bring through, just to kind of show them what a bobcat would look like if they weren't familiar. All right, we're going to proceed on up this trail, and on your way down the other side, you guys will get a true perspective of actually how many supplies were actually brought in here to support 2,000 people for three months.
it is actually 65 feet from the surface to the top of this dome. So it, it, that water made its way a fair way up this channel before it hit the rock too hard to erode anymore. Um, one of the other things I like to point out at this juncture is the crystal formation. Again, you see the rock, uh, red wall limestone, you see the green coral, and you'll begin to see that winter crystal mixed in with some, some of the other selenite crystals that you'll see in the caves. Um, we call some of this cave coral. But mainly what I like to point out is, as I was saying about the stalactites, we do have a few. And what you'll notice is some of them are right here. But that's yeah, well, do it again. the time the water had to drip <laughs> as it drains so rapidly from the core drain. Those are only an inch to two, maybe two and a half inches long. And those are some of the only stalactites in the cave that can be seen. Anybody that wants a picture, I will gladly hold the light. Um, it's kind of hard without light up there. It's kind of tall for a flash. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and if you guys feel free to take another picture or two, I'm going to go ahead and tell you how Walter Peck exits our story. Um, it's the year 1936, and Walter Peck has been doing these undergraduate tours for about nine years. Excuse me, I'm 25. So he's not broke, but he's not rich. Um, and he unfortunately gets a letter from the Arizona government telling him to cease and desist, lowering people down his hole on a rope. Um, at that point, even though Walter had begun a staircase and begun improvements, it wasn't quite enough for the government to be satisfied. He held onto the property until the late 1940s to the very early 1950s, somewhere in there, before he lost it due to being unable to pay his property tax. At that point, a pair of brothers, known as the Rimsby brothers, actually commonly more known today as Yellow Quake Sutton, purchased the property. And they are responsible for everything you see as far as the walkway, the handrails, the lights, the electricity, the elevator shaft, and the tunnels. And one of the interesting things is this little spot right here. You see that concrete used obviously to block up a hole. When they wanted to form these concrete walkways, the way they did it was they drilled a coffee can sized hole from the surface right down into here. They would then mix a very soupy concrete mix from on the surface, pour it down the hole into the sluice box, from that sluice box into that wheelbarrow, and that is how every single inch of this one mile worth of pathways was poured. Oh took one guy, I believe, a, took a year total to get it all done. Um, this is also the point where the natural entities used to be. This is actually where Walter would lower you down and land you 150 feet on that road. Now, it's been sealed off from about maybe two feet above that bridge there all the way to the surface for two reasons. One, we don't want any more critters falling down here, um, injuring themselves, mummifying themselves or anything like that. Number two, we don't want more than the one natural one entrance in the cave because it would change everything. The humidity, the temperature, the moisture level, everything in this cave would change by having two openings. Um, but most importantly, there's a shaft up there with a ledge that's about 50 feet from the surface where two Native American Wallapai Indians are buried. In 1917, they were coming back from a hunting party, and two of the members took sick. They were actually brothers, and they actually died of influenza. The tribe, knowing what influenza was, knowing that in 1917 it was a deadly disease, they chose to bury the two brothers in what they thought was just a 50-foot deep hole. And that's what they did. Then they proceeded on back to the reservation. Well, I hate to make it look like Walter Peck was, you know, a horrible guy, but Walter Peck took advantage of a situation that he knew better than to take advantage of. Walter Peck took those skeletons to the surface and advertised them as cavemen and put them on display for everybody to see. Just another way for him to try to recoup the money he spent on his home in the ground. That caused about... A lot of problems. The Wallapai Nation was up in arms. Um, the Navajo and the Arapaho uh, reservations got involved. Um, and then the Arizona government got involved. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, Walter Peck was told point blank, 
if every single thing that was on that ledge is not put back immediately, you don't even want to know what's going to happen. So the skeletons of the two brothers were placed back on the ledge. Their saddles, um, which were decorative saddles, burial saddles, and their boots, which were decorative boots, um, moccasins. Everything that Walter Peck had taken off that ledge and took to the surface was put back down. And we were told, as soon as we had completed the elevator shaft, this would be sealed permanently forever. And again, from two feet above this um, bridge here, all the way to the surface, which is about 100 feet, is solidly sealed in. And the brothers rest there to this day. Now, as the police have gone down this way, you will notice we have dirty. Dirty is a sad story, but dirty, dirty. Dirty is known as a giant landslide. And the interesting thing about dirty is when dirty fell from the network, it was about somewhere between 15 to 20,000 years ago, back at the end of our last ice age. That's when she was known to have been around these parts. Um, she actually survived the 150 foot fall, and we know that because these are Gertie's claw marks in the wall as she tried to scale the wall back out. We know those are her claw marks because we actually found a piece of her claw broken off in the limestone that is on the surface for your, you know, for your viewing in the uh, glass cases, excuse me. But we also know that it was dirty because right here behind me, as they were preparing to blow out the uh, stairwell for these steps, they found 95% of Gertie's bones intact right here. They thought they had found a dinosaur. They actually changed the name of this place to the Dinosaur Caverns. Well, they sent the remains off to the University of Arizona in Tucson, at which time we were promptly informed you could not find a dinosaur. What you found was a giant landslide. We had no use for the remains at the time, so the deal that was made was they could keep the remains for further study and further research, as well as to put on display down at the university, in exchange for an exact replica based on bone size for us to display in our cabins. Mm -hmm. And what they came up with was this, and Gertie is 15 feet, four inches tall, Gertie weighs 1,000 pounds, and Gertie was between one and two years old when she fell into the hole. Her parents were upwards of 22 to 23 feet, somewhere in the vicinity of 1,800 pounds. So you can just imagine, she was a baby. 